Hello, folks. Welcome to The Power of Zero Show. I am your host, David McKnight, best-selling author of The Power of Zero, Look Before You Lerp, The Volatility Shield, and Tax-Free Income for Life. Uh, if you are looking for someone to help you mitigate both longevity risk and tax rate risk, all within the very same financial plan, head over to davidmcknight.com. If you are in a financial advisor looking for help transitioning your practice to this type of practice, head over to powerzero.com. We'll happy be happy to set up a phone call with you. As always, would love a follow on Twitter. It's at McKnight and Co. At McKnight and Co. Today, uh, we had uh, I had the honor of interviewing um, Dr. Larry Kotlikoff out of Boston University. Um, he is the William Warren Fairfield Professor at Boston University. Uh, he is also a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, a research associate of the National Bureau of Economic Research, a fellow of the Economic Society, former senior economist, and was formerly on President Ronald Reagan's Council of Economic Advisors. Uh, we had a wide-ranging discussion about the future of our country and possible solutions, and should we be worried about a Great Depression anytime soon? Sit back, take a listen to my interview, with Dr. Larry Kotlikoff. Dr. Kotlikoff, welcome to the Power of Zero show. Great, great to be with you, David. When I talk to my listeners about you, um, we're primarily talking about fiscal gap accounting or what's sometimes referred to as generational accounting. Um, can you describe for our listeners how that works and why it's important that countries operate their balance sheets in that way? Sure. Uh, well, you know, we have lots of uh, official debts that we've accumulated, and that's where all the attention goes. Uh, the federal debt to GDP ratio will be about 110% of GDP by the end of this year. It's, uh, it's going to be like 30% of GDP higher than it was just going back a few years ago. So there's been a huge increase in deficit spending uh, to deal with COVID and also because, um, you know, frankly, the Republicans didn't want to raise taxes uh, during their their uh, time in office. And now the Democrats are taking their turn not to uh, raise taxes while spending a lot. So, but we have lots of debts that are off the books. So think about the obligations to pay me my social security benefits. So I have like an implicit IOU from Uncle Sam it's not on the books. It's not included as part of the 130% of, uh, of GDP that is official debt. So when I pay into uh, Social Security, they describe that as my giving them taxes. And the benefits I get later, they call that a transfer payment. But they could easily call that, or I could call that, or you could call that my making a loan to the government, and they're paying me back interest plus principal later on. So our choice of language is completely arbitrary here. Economic theory does not pin down what we call official borrowing versus unofficial. So the governments have left a lot of things off the books. They've called things unofficial to keep them off the books so they would disguise from the public what they're really doing. Now, when you put all the unofficial liabilities uh, on the books, as well as all the unofficial assets, like the you know the revenue, the tax, the government's going to be getting tax revenues in, uh, and that's really an asset through time to pay for stuff. So what fiscal gap accounting does is it puts everything on the books. It says, look, forget what we call it. Let's just look at all the outlays the government is projected to do through time, whether you call it transfer payments, Social Security benefits, Medicare benefits, food stamps. Uh, uh, servicing official debt, no matter what you call it, it's just outlays, money out, and then there's money coming in. Get the present value difference, the value in the present of the difference between these two streams. One's uh, the, called the outlays, one's the, uh, you know, the receipts. Add in any official, uh, any government assets that, you know, that we own, and then look at how big that number is as a share of GDP. That's about eight years of GDP. So our official debts are recording about one year of GDP, and uh, there's another seven years of GDP that we're not counting because they're off the books. So the fiscal gap is a true problem. 
Now, the European Union, which is the uh, you know an operating branch of the Europe, well, they, they have got something called the European Council, which is an operating branch of the European Union. They do this fiscal gap accounting every three years for all the EU member nations. So we have some, you know, part of the developed world that's doing this thing systematically. And if you look at uh, all the countries in Europe and then compare that with the U.S., the U.S. is like uh, twice as bad as the worst country in Europe, in the European Union, in terms of a debt, a fiscal gap to GDP ratio. Yep. And so as as I've understood it, um, and this, you know, I may not be up to date on your most recent number, but the last I saw from you, the fiscal gap was $239 trillion, meaning that we would have to have $239 trillion sitting in a bank account today, earning treasury rates to be able to deliver on everything that we've promised that we really can't afford to pay. Is that sort of, is my understanding of that correct? Well, I've, I've kind of reworked the numbers and thought about what the right uh, uh, discount rate would be to discount um, dollars in the future to the present, to make, uh, to value dollars in the, in the future in, in the present. And, um, I've come to realize that uh, a higher discount rate was more appropriate. So it's more like $160 in absolute terms, but as a share of GDP, the discount rate doesn't matter that much because you're also taking the present value of future GDP. Uh, so uh, if you think about it in terms of the share of the present value of future GDP, it's like uh, we need to um, have about 8% uh, more taxes every year to pay for the spending it's not covered by other receipts that's kind of the way to think about it we need like two uh social security programs in terms of two two more payroll taxes if you like to cover what we're short so the so the uh the absolute number is about eight years of gdp which is currently gdp is around 21 22 trillion so we're talking about 160 trillion in absolute terms but as a share of the present value of GDP, if you say to yourself, well, how much do we have to raise taxes right now so that we won't have to raise taxes forever, any, any more in the future? And we'll just have permanently higher uh, share of GDP collected as taxes. Well, we need about 8% path of, uh, of GDP in extra taxes forever to cover the shortfall. That's enormous, okay? I mean, the Social Security taxes and the Medicare taxes uh, are not 8% of GDP right now. They're probably more like 6% of GDP. So it's like having another FICA tax plus something. So, so you can see we're in trouble. So in the, uh, in the movie, uh, The Tax Train is Coming, you talked about how, you know, I think at the time our debt to GDP ratio was something on the order of 100% or 103%, something like that. Um, you talked about, were we to include all of the off the, all the off the books obligations and transfer payments, that debt to GDP ratio would really be much closer to 1,000%. Um, is that, do you feel like that number is still accurate when comparing our GDPs to the other GDPs, sorry, debt to GDPs uh, of other countries in the world? The fiscal gap relative to our current GDP is about 800 percent uh, uh 800 okay okay it's eight times uh gdp uh when we talk about the debt numbers uh there's the gross debt and then there's the debt in the hands of the public see the federal reserve has printed money and bought back some of the debt a good chunk of the debt so uh when i was talking about the official debt becoming 110 percent of gdp by the end of this year i was talking about the debt in the hands of the public this is the number that oh, the gotcha. office is focused on. Now they, you know, they have these. So when they print money uh, and they retire, in effect, buy back the bonds, then the government has no obligation to pay interest to anybody in the private sector, right? It's like uh, this is kind of a form of taxation because if you print money, prices go up eventually, and then the people that had money to begin with lose the real value of that money goes down, and that's right. called the tax. So uh, so the CBO says, well, let's just focus on the debt that's in the hands of the public, because if we bought back some debt, we've already, in effect, 
uh, tax the public through the seniorage mechanism. We've come up with our own taxes, which is printing money, right? You know, one way you can cut right. One way you can think is some people think you, well, if you have eight years of GDP uh, problem, just print eight years of GDP in debt, uh, in, in dollars. Just print $160 trillion in dollar bills. And the official money supply is about $3 trillion. So you can imagine the hyperinflation that that would produce. But there's some people dumb enough to can propose this uh, out there, these uh, money, modern monetary, quote, theorists, I don't know whether where they got there. You think where they think they became theorists, but uh, they wouldn't get through undergraduate economics in my class with the way they're. <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, so that's that's not really an option. We can we can toy with that a little bit, printing money, and we have done a whole lot of that printing of money. So we have the option, the potential already for very high. Uh, price increases, uh, not just to deal with temporary, not the temporary price increases that Jerome Powell, the head of the Fed, is talking about as we come out of COVID, but I'm talking about uh, prices going up by a factor of six because we've had, had so much money printed uh, since uh, 2008. Now, the Fed, for its part, says, well, don't worry, we've got these bonds and you know we, we printed money, we bought the bonds, and now we've got them. And we could go take the money out of the economy. If prices started going up, we'll um, get, grab money out of the economy by reversing the operation. We'll take the bonds, sell them to the public, and take back greenbacks. And that might work, but then you have, in effect, um, you know, reduced. <laughs> uh, now you've got more official interest, that you, you know, in principle, that you have to pay to the public. So. It's not like uh, the fiscal gap goes away when you do that. Uh, the printing printing money is like a form of taxation. So if you say, well, we're not going to use that form of taxation, then you've got this burden has to be placed on what's left in the form of tax uh, power, taxing power. And uh, uh, so we, we do need to kind of collect receipts or, or get get tax revenue, if you like, from every source we can. But the problem with printing money to do this is that things could get out of control in terms of uh, prices spiral, spiraling up and people expecting very high inflation for a long time. It's very hard to change people's expectations. And then, you know, it, I don't know if you're, you're not old enough to remember the 70s, but we had pretty high inflation back then. And the expectations of people kind of drive the inflation rate, not the actual policy. And then it becomes very hard to, to for the Fed to do anything but accommodate those expectations, unless they want to kind of step on the on the brakes, which is what Volcker did in '79. He said, "I'm going to step on the brakes," and uh, interest rates went from like you know seven percent to twenty percent overnight, and the economy crashed. Yeah, that was the 1981-82 recession. So yeah. they're in a tough place because they're not you know. Basically, you can't have the Fed running fiscal policy when you have Congress out of control for decades. Well, it's it's interesting. We know the, the classical approach is that you either raise taxes, reduce spending, or some combination of the two. And um, that's long been what we've talked about. And those are the two alternatives. But as you have rightly pointed out, recently, it's become much more in vogue to uh, entertain this idea of modern monetary theory, which is, I think, made popular in part by Stephanie Kelton's book, The Deficit Myth, and that seems to be really gaining currency and um, left wings, uh, left leaning circles. And um, I, I think what you've pointed out is that you can't print your way out of this problem. And um, I, I believe you're friends with uh, Alan Arbach uh, out of uh, out of Berkeley. I got off the phone with him five minutes before I we started this podcast. So yeah, yeah. Well, one of the points one of the points that he brings up in the movie, which is also the movie that you were in, was that um, you know Social Security or Medicare is is paid for in kind. I mean, if if uh, an appointment a doctor's appointment costs a hundred dollars and we try to inflate our way out of the Medicare problem, then the cost of a doctor's appointment is just going to go up. And so the, the, the cost of the 
you know, the, the Medicare program as a whole will rise commensurately. And so clearly printing our way out of the problem is not, is not the solution. Do you see politicians indulging modern monetary theory at some point over the next 10 to 15 years? Well, I think they have the whole system. You know, I don't, I don't think we should really separate the Treasury and the Congress and the, and the Federal Reserve. Just think about this as Uncle, Uncle Sam and just look at what he's been doing for, uh, for quite a while now. He's been using a lot of money creation to pay for what he spends. And we've gotten through uh, this period without high price increases. But uh, as I told uh, Stephanie Kelton, I'm not sure she got this point. Uh, when I was debating her recently um, in a UK conference, uh, it was a Zoom conference, and, and these other modern monetary quote theorists. Um, so I was saying, look, you know, you're saying that inflation has no cost because we printed a lot of money. We haven't seen any inflation. I said, well, you're not looking hard enough because you have to look at what uh, prices would have been had we not engaged in this policy. So COVID hits, we likely would have had, had the Fed not intervened in this manner, we probably would have had deflation like we had in the 30s. And consequently, the fact that prices are you know, rising at whatever 2% right now, uh, they would otherwise be maybe declining by 5 7%. So relative to what would otherwise have been the case, we're, we're seeing inflation. So, and that's costing people like you and me and everybody else in the public. Uh, when we go and try and spend our fixed pensions or our salaries that haven't gone up commensurate with that kind of an increase, uh, we're worse off because we can't buy as much. So she just hasn't seen the cost of inflation because she hasn't thought about uh, the right, right way to think about it, which is relative to what the price path would have been had the Fed not been printing all this money. So I said that, and I think it went completely in, in one ear and out the other, and she was off with her mantra. Uh, these people, you know, they don't sound like regular economists. They don't sound like they're thinking, uh, when you talk to them, they sound like they're religious fanatics. And, or, and Or at the very least, political ideologues, right? Yeah. And we have a lot, you know, too many ideologues on both sides right now. Uh, and we and we have, you know, whenever an economist gets too close to one of these political parties, uh, they, it's like their their wings melt, right? <laughs> right. Uh, Icarus. Icarus getting too close to the sun, and they turn into politicians. And that's the, the case for people on the left and people on the right. I, my view is that any economist who gets uh, affiliated, who wants to affiliate with a political party or some political, uh, you know, some kind of a uh, political cause, that strongly should give up their uh, economist card. They should just say, look, I'm a politician. I used to be an economist, but no more. Uh, and they shouldn't parade as if they actually have a PhD in economics because they're not using it. Right. So. So help me understand, I, I've gotten into online feuds with modern monetary theorists and they just don't seem to want to give an inch. My, my understanding with modern monetary theory is the way it works is you can print money as much as you want. And so long as that money, well, you know, if it could be used to pay for a guaranteed $15 minimum wage, it could be used to, to waive student debt or make college education free. Uh, you know, universal basic income, what, as long as that, the printing of that money results in increased economic output and it's growing the pie for everyone, then you're not going to see inflation because you'll have, you know, an increased amount of money, but it'll be chasing an increased amount of goods and services. Where, I'd love to call upon your vast experience and expertise to, to, to sort of poke as big a hole as you can in that theory. And I'm, I, 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 I disagree with it as you do. I just would love to have a famous economist that can poke a hole in it. Well, I think, um, you know, what I just was kind of getting at, which is that we've had this printing of money and uh, they're not, we're not seeing huge uh, price increases or 
much of an, much inflation so far at all for the last uh, uh, going back to 2008 we've had a big increase in the money supply now you have to ask what would the counterfactual have been would, would we have had deflation in that case we've got if the path of prices would have been declining uh, alternatively had the Fed not been printing all this money then we've had inflation relative to that path so the idea that uh, so you have to look at uh, you say okay this policy had no one no effect but you have to say well what if the policy hadn't taken place what would have been the price path and so relative to that it might have had a very big effect so I think that they just are missing how to think about about it but even if you could say well look uh, 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 there's something that's keeping prices from rising it's expectations of the public that um, um, that are, are uh, leading uh, firms who have products not, not to raise prices because they don't expect other people to raise prices they don't want to get out of line uh, so now you have this potential for uh, adjustment that could involve very high inflation. Uh, in other words, you have the you lay the uh, groundwork for uh, prices to be, let's say, flat for a while and then jump up dramatically. So that's uh, the other thing that they're not understanding, which is that you've laid the groundwork for a big problem. It's it's the same thing with the deficits. You know, we're accumulating the, the debt, explicit debt, and implicit debt. Now, what if people suddenly understand that the U.S. is broke? What if enough people tune into this podcast and understand that the U.S. is in worse fiscal shape than any other country in the developed world? And I say that without any hesitation, by, by a mile. And they start dumping U.S. Treasury bonds. Suppose you get a million uh, 100 million views of this podcast and people's ex views start to change and uh, the press starts to talk about this and the politicians start to talk about the fiscal gap. Now people on in Wall Street will sell these bonds uh, because they think other people will sell the bonds, the U.S. Treasury bonds, interest rates will, sh uh, will soar and then we'll see that there's a problem associated with the this kind of fiscal policy, that we're gonna to start uh, to feel the kind of pressure that a, a Greece or an Italy felt when they were running, and they still are running high debt to GDP ratios that they can't borrow at reasonable rates. So, so what I'm trying to get across here is that there's a dynamic, and when you, let me put it this way, um, you know you've got a big, big bills coming, you've got some some money set aside, and then you decide to blow it because, gee, for the next, you know, the bill's due in a year, and, uh, you know, and, and the money that you'd saved up to, to spend on that bill, you just start parting with it. Uh, and you say, you know, day after day, hey, there's no problem. But that day is gonna come where you have to pay that bill, and if you can't, your house will be, you know, might have to, you know, hand over your house, go bankrupt. Uh, that's what they don't get. There's a dynamic yeah. here. The whole thing just seems terribly risky to me. I mean, you're basically staking the future fiscal viability of our country on a theory that you may think in your own mind works out well, but historically has not worked out well. And uh, if you pile on top that bet that you're making on top of the fiscal, um, you know, the, the fiscal instability that we're already experiencing, I, I, I could just see disastrous results 10 to 15 years down the road. Let me just say one other thing, which is uh, this whole process is like slowly growing cancer. This is uh, a process that may take 20, 50, 100 years to fully play out. Uh, think about Argentina. 2000 and, in 1910 or so, they were the fifth highest per capita GDP country. Then they started engaging in these kinds of uh, policies of, of running uh, large official, non-official deficits, printing money. Through time, they have had inflation, high interest rates, 
uh, defaulted on their debt, and they've become a developing country. They've gone from being a developed country to a developing country. And that's kind of the path I see us on, uh, frankly. But it's they took 100 years to be where they are, and we may take 100 years. Uh, it may be till 2050 until people really see that, gee, the U.S. has screwed this, screwed this one up. And then it will be too late because to reverse course requires imposing a lot of pain on a small subset of people. So you're kind of stuck in a bad equilibrium forever. You're kind of like in a, a, a permanent po poverty trap because you, you're kind of swimming in bills and you can either kind of renege on paying the old people what you owe them, pensions and debt repayments, uh, and let them starve and then get from out, out from, over, uh, from under. But if you can't do that politically because the old people have too much political party power and it's also not more you know, ethically appropriate, then you're stuck there forever with permanently high tax rates and people fleeing the country because they, they see more opportunity abroad. Okay, folks, that was the end of part one of our interview with Dr. Larry Kotlikoff. Uh, part two will be next week. Once again, if you are looking for help to navigate all of the issues of which we spoke during this interview, head over to davidmcknight.com. If you are a financial advisor who is looking for help to transition your practice to a Power of Zero type practice, head over to powerofzero.com. As always, would uh, really appreciate a follow on Twitter. It's at McKnight and Co. And a subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. Talk to you same time next week.